I hope everybody had a sweet Thanksgiving. I know we did as a family. It was a lot of fun. And uh, being able to have family around. We didn't do uh, turkey this year. We did tri-tip. So that was, uh, it was a lot of fun to smoke some tri-tip. But uh, sweet just to have enjoyable fellowship and uh, be able to thank the Lord and just praise Him for the things He's provided for us. And so this morning, we are not going to be talking about Thanksgiving. We're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 18. And if you've got your Bible with you, and I hope you do, uh, you can go ahead and make your way there. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray and uh, open up our time as we do that. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, I praise you, Lord, for your grace. Lord, you are a God who is immense. Lord, you are a God who is not far off, but a God who is near. You are a God who has unending supply of all that is needed. You are one who has fashioned and made the heavens and the earth and all that is contained within them. And Lord, you are the one who portions out to each individual the things you desire for them to have. Uh, Lord, you are a God that we can rely on in the midst of difficult circumstances. You are a God who provides immensely. Lord, there is never a time where we will be without what we need because your good hand gives all that is needed, not only to your enemies, but God, also to your people that you know and that you love, individuals that you have called out. God, as we spend time this morning laboring uh, to look at the salvation story of a very unlikely convert, God, this is the salvation story, Lord, of every person who comes to the knowledge of the living God. And I pray, Lord, you would fill our hearts with fresh grace, with a fresh outlook on our own salvation, and Lord, as we look at the story of this man Jethro in the Old Testament. Let me ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. I want you guys just to take a minute and think back to your own salvation story. Do you remember where you were? Do you remember what you heard? And do you remember how you responded to it? You know, some individuals, they can actually think back and they can remember the moment that they got saved. Uh, they went from being completely opposed to God, and then in an instant, they moved to where they saw their sin, the need to repent, and they put their faith in Christ. And the contrast between those things was really stark. Then you have other individuals where maybe that's a little elusive. Uh, they think about the fact that they grew up in the church. I, I, I've always been a believer. Uh, I've always been sitting underneath this teaching. I've always known that Christ is the Messiah. I've always known that I was a sinner. And so I can't think of a time where that contrast changed. This has just been the pattern. But regardless of the situation, whether there was a, an event that occurred or whether it's, I was always in this pattern, there's always going to be some things that are very common. You heard about the great and miraculous power of God in the gospel. You saw your sin and its ugliness. You were moved to repent and praise him for saving you from your sin. And you moved to a life of worship as you followed him. And you're going to find that pattern in every individual that comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ. You're going to find the same pattern when you look in the Old Testament and you see individuals that come to a saving knowledge of Yahweh. They fear the Lord. This is really just how God has always saved individuals. Our text today captures a similar redemptive story, but... It's a redemptive story of somebody in the Old Testament coming to saving faith in Yahweh. Rather than saving faith in Christ in the New Testament, the fulfillment of God dealing with the sin of his people culminating in Jesus Christ on the cross, this is the Old Testament story of someone being saved by God's grace. We're going to focus on verses 8 through 12, but we're going to read verses 1 through 12. And then I'm going to take the time to give us a decent amount of background on what's happening up to this point. And then we'll get to our points in the text after that. But picking it up at verse 1, you guys can follow along as I read. It says, Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how Yahweh had brought Israel out of Egypt. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife Zipporah after he had sent her away, 
and her two sons, of whom one was named Gershom. For Moses said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the other was named Eleazar, for he said, The God of my father was my help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was camped at the Mount of God. And he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. And Moses went down to meet his father-in-law, and he bowed down and kissed him, and they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. And Moses recounted to his father-in-law all that Yahweh had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had befallen them on the journey and how Yahweh had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which Yahweh had done to Israel, that he had delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro said, blessed be Yahweh who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all the gods. For in this matter, they acted presumptuously against the people. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. Now, the background of this text is, is just interesting. The people of Israel are probably two months outside of their exodus uh, from the land of Egypt at this point. Uh, right after they cross the, the, um, the Red Sea, you find themselves stating uh, they've been there for one month. Right after this event, if you look over at chapter 19, it says, In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on this day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. So we're looking at probably two and a half months, three months after they've left Egypt. And that's when this event occurs. Before this text, I'll say this. Nothing ordinary has happened. <laughs> The most extraordinary things that have ever happened really in history on the face of this earth prior to the flood and creation account is the event in Exodus. There's nothing ordinary. Wild, crazy things are happening. They had made their way into the wilderness. Moses has been leading the people out of Egypt. One of the things that is extraordinary prior to this event, and even when Jethro comes, is that God's visible presence is there with them in the camp. By day, there's a pillar of cloud that is visible, and by night, the greatest night light that has ever been constructed is there in the wilderness. There is a burning pillar of fire. God's visible presence is there for the people of Israel. Think about the manna. Again, we're talking about extraordinary events. The manna that is provided for the people miraculously. There are 600,000 men that went out of Israel, part, uh, went out of Egypt, the people of Israel. But that doesn't include the women. It doesn't include the children. And so if you're looking at commentaries, most individuals will say there were probably around 2 million people that left Egypt going out with Moses. Now, if I think about somebody just wanting a sandwich, and you've got two million people that need a sandwich every day, it's a lot. I want you to think about this. The manna that is prescribed in terms of the volume of manna per person, it basically adds up to about one carton of milk. So each person got their carton of milk full of manna every single day. If I was going to take that, and I took every person's carton of milk, and I laid them all out on a football field, just think of the size of that. The cartons of milk would be six feet deep every single day. That is the manna that God was providing for the people of Israel. Can you imagine a football field with that much bread in it? Every day, you had to provide that volume. God is providing that for the people in the middle of a wilderness every morning. It's extraordinary. 
It doesn't even account for the number of quail that he's providing for them. Maybe they had a, the football field of manna, the football field of quail that was provided every single day. Think about the water that was necessary in the middle of the wilderness. That many people. If you're going to think through every person that's needing two liters of water every day, uh, that means you're going to need an Olympic swimming pool every single day just to provide for the water that would, people would need in the wilderness. That doesn't account for the animals or the livestock. That's just people. That's just people. You think about the size. I don't know if anybody remembers a long time ago, Washington, D.C., the Million Man March uh, that occurred in Washington, D.C. If you've seen pictures of that, it, it looks like ants that are making their way across your lawn in terms of the volume of people. And that's only a million of them. Just to give you guys context in terms of the volume of people, Phoenix in 2023 only had 1.63 million people in it. We're talking about 2 million people in the wilderness in Sinai. Extraordinary events. God is providing everything that is needed in an environment that does not produce what is needed. You get to see God's hand of provision for the people. I mean, just make this just a, an implication for us even just right now. We doubt God, do we not? We doubt that he will provide for our needs in difficult circumstances. We doubt that he will provide for our needs possibility of a job loss. How are we going to make ends meet? We have a child that's not listening to us. The difficulty of a circumstance. How is this going to go? Can we trust God in the midst of a difficult circumstance? If I look at my own life, I am so quick to doubt God's goodness. I'm so quick to think that he can't provide when I look at circumstances and say, there's no way his provision will come because the circumstances do not match what I think will come about. I'm so quick to do this. We are quick to not trust God in his provision. This is just a helpful reminder that we can trust him. We can trust him. This is the scene that Jethro walks into. So he walks in to the land the people are in, in the wilderness. And just think about, there's the army ant of people everywhere. You've got small tents peppered all across the horizon. And you think about what the wilderness looks like. It's a lot like Arizona. So you've got vast wilderness, desert everywhere. And then you've got mountains projecting their way off of the surface of the dirt. The scene is stark. Jethro walks in. He has Zipporah with him, the two sons. She's not coming with a baby carriage. The sons are probably in their 30s at this point. And she comes to visit. Jethro comes into this context. The pillar of, pillar of fire by night, the cloud that is able to be visible during the day. No doubt there is manna that is visible. He can see God's provision for the people. And this is what he walks into. One of the questions we have to think through, and many of us know the context, but for those that don't, who is Jethro? This is a good question to work through. Who is this guy that shows up? You guys can turn back to Exodus chapter 2 real quick, just so we can look at this. If you guys think back to the book of Exodus... Um, the starting point of the book of Exodus is obviously us being introduced to Moses. Now, Moses is divinely preserved by the Lord in the midst of genocide that's occurring within Egypt. The people of Israel are growing in mass in Egypt and their population is increasing. God is blessing them. But at some point, Moses rises up and he desires to deliver his people, but he doesn't know how to do it. He's doing it in his own means. And he ends up killing an Egyptian who is... Um, trying to injure a Israelite that is there. And so he rises up in order to intervene. But then he flees because Pharaoh finds out about what occurred. And so we see this in 2.15. We can pick it up here. It says, And Pharaoh heard of this matter. So he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh, and he settled in the land of Midian. Then he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian, that's Jethro, had seven daughters, and they came and they drew water and they filled the troughs to give water to their father's flock to drink. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses rose up and saved them and gave water to their flock to drink. 
Then they came to Reuel, their father. It's another name for Jethro. And he said, why have you come back so soon today? So they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And he actually even drew the water and he gave us water to, uh, to the flock to drink. And he said to his daughters, well, where is he then? Why is it you've left the man behind? Call him so he may eat bread. And Moses was willing to settle down with the man and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son and he named him Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. This is really the Old Testament Hallmark movie moment. Okay, this is the, the scene. There's the woman in distress. Apparently there's seven of them. But it works out, eventually finds the one that he wants. And so you have this marriage relationship with Zipporah. I want you guys just to think through the impact of Moses and this man Jethro on his life. Jethro is an individual that in the midst of Moses fleeing everything that he has known and loved, everything he has grown up in in his entire life, Jethro becomes the one that cares for him. He's a unique individual, is he not? Moses is 40 years old when he flees from Egypt. He is in Midian for 40 years with Jethro. Is that not a significant portion of time in your life to be impacted and shaped by an individual? Jethro provided him with family. He provided him with a home. He provided him with food. He gave him a job. All of these things. How, did you th- how do you think Moses thought about his father-in-law Jethro? No doubt he loved him. No doubt he had great respect for him. And he was indebted to him as well. This man provided for his needs in a season that was incredibly difficult for Moses. He had nothing. And in the land of Midian, Jethro, the priest of Midian, provided for him. Make no mistake, Moses honors his father-in-law. And the text demonstrates that. He goes and turn back to chapter 18. It's interesting to see in verse 1, the fact that he honors, not in verse one, but further down, he honors his father-in-law. You see this when he comes up. Verse seven, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. He bowed down, he kissed him. They asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Now, just think about it. You have the ant army of all of the people of Israel there. You have Moses here, and here comes Jethro. He's the priest of Midian. He's a foreigner in that sense. He's the father-in-law of Moses. What does he do? He bows down in reverence to his father-in-law in in front of everyone. This is good for me to think about my (laughs) father-in-law. I hope this is good for you to think about your father-in-law if you have one. If you're a son-in-law and you have a father-in-law, this is a good text for you to see the reverence that is good and right and excellent for family. Moses demonstrates this in front of everyone. How are you doing at demonstrating this to your own father-in-law? Loving him, honoring him, caring for him privately, publicly. This isn't even part of what we're looking at. It's free, but it's worth looking at and at least talking about, right? Something else we need to look at in verse 1 in terms of thinking about this man Jethro is titles. Look back at verse 1. It says, Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law. Now, we love titles, and we use them all the time, do we not? Um, but we usually use them in association with a need. Uh, Jacob Hanlow, as we all know, is not only an elder at the church, but he's a doctor. Um, now, if a person is looking to cook some food, and they need to know, man, how do I cook this? Well, you need to talk with Jake Hanlow. He's a doctor. That doesn't make any sense. Um, You'd say, this person's a chef, right? The title gives validity to the thing you're saying you need to talk with this person on. Jake Hamlin's a doctor. You're sick. You should call him. He'd be able to give you some counsel. We also can say this negatively as well in terms of a concern. Man, can you pray for my friend Bill? He's an atheist. He doesn't know the Lord. Bill... Atheist, there's a title, concern that comes as a result. We give titles for a reason. Moses does this here with Jethro. 
He does it on purpose. Take a peek at this. Two things are given focus. One, Jethro came. And listen to this. He is the priest of Midian. He doesn't say he's a a priest. He he says he's the priest of Midian. And that's the first title that he chooses. He wants us to know this is a pagan priest of Midian that is coming. The second thing he wants us to know is that he is the father-in-law of Moses. Look at verse 2. It says Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. Verse 5, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. Verse 6, I, your father-in-law, Jethro. Verse 7, his father-in-law. Verse 8, his (laughs) father-in-law. Come down to verse 12. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. Verse 12 at the bottom, Moses, uh, Moses' father-in-law. Look at verse 14, Moses' father-in-law. Verse 15, his father-in-law. It it keeps going. Thirteen times he names Jethro as his father-in-law. I think it's, it's something we need to see. It's something we need to think about. He wants all of the people of Israel for all of history and us now to know the connection between Moses and Jethro, the priest of Midian, as his father-in-law is important. The connection between the people of Midian as a foreign people outside of God's promises connected to Moses is something Moses wants us to see. He's not concerned about it. He's not fearful of it. He wants them to see, listen, my wife is a Midianite. My sons are mixed. He wants them to see that God is not fearful of these things. He wants them to see the salvation story of Jethro. The Midianites, just so you guys know, they were more of a scattered people, uh, generally. And they didn't really have cities or uh, established places where they were. They were clans of individuals. In scripture, they're shown living in Gilead and Moab and Edom and into the Arabian desert. They appear also to have been allies with the Amalekites, the Edomites, Ammonites, Moabites, and the Ishmaelites. And this is something just to think about. They were not friendly towards the people of Israel generally. They are shown actually to be the worshipers of Baal. This is a, a quote just taken from the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible. You can at least can listen to this. It says in the Balaam, quote, in the Balaam episode and its bloody aftermath, Numbers 2231, a substantial group of Midianites appears to have been living on the eastern frontier of Moab. The Moabite king, Balak, who was subject to the Amorite king named Sihon, this is in chapter 21 of Numbers, discusses the Israelite threat with the elders of Midian, and a joint delegation was sent to Balaam, end quote. Baal worshippers are the individuals who have shown, they had the showdown with Elijah on top of Mount Carmel, right? We can think of that from 1 Kings. Gideon's father was a Baal worshipper in the period of the Judges. That's in Judges 6.25. In fact, even more interesting, Midian is the nation that was oppressing the people of Israel during the period of Gideon. And just think about that. We've already talked about it. The Lord wants us to know and see the connection between Moses and Jethro as a Midianite is good. And there's a reason for it. There's a logical flow and a pivot that is here. What God is able to do with a priest who is a priest of a pagan God is unique in the way that he does it with every single person on the face of the earth. He's able to save them from their idolatry. That's what Moses wants us to see. Think back to Abraham. He was a pagan, right? Saved out of Ur of the Chaldees. This is a man who worshipped a pantheon of gods. What does God do? He plucks him out. He sends him to a land and he makes promises to him that only grow over time. What does Abraham do? He puts his faith in the promise that God gave. God counts it to him as righteousness. God saves individuals in this way and Jethro is no different. And so this moves us into our three scenes in the unlikely convert salvation story. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Three scenes in an unlikely convert salvation story. Three events in the salvation story of Jethro. 
And the first one that we see is in verse 8. He hears the testimony of the Lord's deliverance. It says, Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake. All the hardship that had befallen them on the journey and how the Lord had delivered them. Now, just imagine everything that Moses had witnessed. I mean, just, you think through everything that he saw. You think through everything that he experienced. Staggering to consider everything that he had seen, commanded, uh, the response of the people. Have you guys ever gone through an event? Maybe you went on a vacation. Maybe you had a traumatic event that occurred. Uh, let's put it in the vacation context. Let's do that, okay? And you experience two weeks of a blissful vacation. It was wonderful. And then someone says, man, how was vacation? You're, you're, you're grasping it like, how do I start? Well, we ate this, and we went here, and I slept. I mean, that happened. Uh, we did that a lot, actually, on vacation. Um, you're going to try to think through, how do I work through and communicate the vacation in a way that people are going to hear it? They're going to understand the breadth of what happened. Moses has to think through that. How do you tell it? We tend to tell highlights. I really think that Moses just told him everything. But how do you summarize that? At the beginning of, of chapter 18, here's something to think on. Verse 1, it says that Jethro had already heard rumblings about what was occurring in Egypt. It's also interesting to think about the fact that Zipporah is now coming back with the two sons, even though they went with him. If you guys can remember and think back to that, they went with him when he went to Egypt. Here, they're coming back. We don't have a biblical record on why, when they left Egypt, but we do know they're returning. And so it makes sense that verse 1 of them says that he had heard about the things that were happening. More than likely, Zipporah and the two sons, they actually gave him a general report of the things that had occurred at that point. Either way, his understanding is limited. But here's some points that probably came up in the retelling of the story. And I've got three of them. He probably would have told them about God commissioning him for his work. That's one. He probably would have told him what happened. And he probably would have told him why it happened. And so let's start with just his commissioning. You guys can think back to when Moses left and made his way to Midian. Eventually, you get to where God calls out Moses on top of Mount Horeb. This is verse 18 in chapter 4 of Exodus. You guys can just listen. It says, Then Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law. Oh, man, look at this. I'm missing this section. I'm so sorry. After he receives um, the revelation from the Lord, seeing the burning bush. It's actually in verse 1 of chapter 3. And I'll read it. It says, Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 12 of chapter 3. And Yahweh said, Certainly, Moses, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall worship God at this mountain. Jethro would have needed to hear from Moses that God himself had commissioned him to go to Egypt. God himself had commissioned him to go and bring the people out. What's interesting is that he didn't tell Jethro this when he left. This is chapter 4 verse 18. It says, And Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go. And he's talking about Egypt. Please let me go, that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt, and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to him, or said to Moses, Go in peace. So there's no indication that even though he had this revelation from the Lord, he reveals himself in the burning bush, he commissions him to go to Egypt. When he leaves, he doesn't tell Jethro all of the details. He just asks if he's able to depart. This is a segment of the story that Jethro didn't know. He needed to hear these things. What's unique in the commissioning in chapter 3, verse 12, I already read it, is one of God's promises is that the people of Israel would return to the Mount Horeb at Sinai, which is where they are, and that would be a sign that God had actually brought everything about. This is what he said in 12. He said, certainly I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Is that crazy? 
Jethro is hearing Moses say, God said this would happen. Look around and look at all of the people. God is faithful to his promise. And the Lord commissioned me to do this. Jethro would have needed to hear this. He needed to hear it. He needed to also hear what wonders happened in Egypt. He needed the fuller picture of these things. He needed to hear the things didn't initially go the way that Moses intended and thought they would go. Uh, you guys remember and think about it. Moses comes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And I think he has this assumption in his mind that Pharaoh's going to say, oh yeah, that sounds reasonable. You know, you guys go ahead. That sounds fine. Take the two million people and go ahead and leave. And what he says is, I don't know who Yahweh is. No, I'm not going to let the people go. I'm obviously paraphrasing. And then he increases the labor for the people. It gets harder for the people of Israel. You end up seeing that Moses, in going to Egypt, he is unable to bring people out of Egypt in his own strength. Jethro needed to hear that Yahweh alone, the Lord alone, is the one that was able to do it. Moses' weakness is actually on display here. It's helpful for, us, helpful for us to think about in the midst even of the things that we are called to do, are we not weak Are we not weak? Moses was commissioned by the Lord. He was given powerful signs that he was able to go do. Do you remember what it was on his mouth? Listen, I'm not good at talking. My speech is just really bad. Send somebody else. God commissions him for a task. Eventually Aaron comes with him and Aaron becomes the one that speaks. Moses is a man who's weak. He's fearful. He's feeble. Jethro needed to see that, yes, Moses was commissioned to be the individual to go, but Yahweh, the Lord, is the one that strengthened him. Here's a list of the miracles, the what, that happened in Egypt. Aaron's rod became a serpent. Water was turned into blood. Frogs all over the land. The plague of the gnats. The plague of the flies. The Egyptian cattle died. The plague of the boils. The plague of hail. The plague of locusts. Darkness over the land, death of the firstborn. I mean, just devastated the nation of Egypt. Coming out of Egypt, the Passover lamb, atonement covering so that the homes that had the blood over them, the firstborn would not die in those homes. The feast of unleavened bread, so the people of Israel will remember the rushed speed at which they had to leave Egypt. God leading the people out, Pharaoh in pursuit, the sea, the Red Sea being divided entirely. A wall on the right, a wall on the left. And they walked through the middle of it. One of the only superpowers really in Jethro's day was Egypt. You had others, you had Assyria and other nations that were there, but they were devastated by the God of Israel. The what that he needed to hear were these plagues devastated this nation. Jethro is hearing that while the nation of Egypt lies in ruins, the people of God, the people of Israel were protected and sustained. Remember the football field, remember the manna. Remember how much provision God is regularly giving to the people. They are sustained. Egypt is devastated. On top of that, remember this. The people of God, they are regularly grumbling in the midst of this. Even in the sustaining nature of God providing for the people, there is grumbling that is there. But Jethro is no doubt thinking this. He is a Baal-worshipping father-in-law of Moses, the priest of Midian, and he is hearing that the gods of Egypt were no match for Yahweh. Not one of them. Not one of them. Makes you think what Jethro was considering in his mind. Man, is Baal able to stand up to Yahweh? If the gods of Egypt have no chance of standing up to Yahweh, is Baal able to do such things? I think the next thing that he would have communicated is is the why. And this is even more critical for us to look at. The why. I'm going to read a lot of passages that are helpful for us just to see this. 
First reason on why God brought about the deliverance of the people of Israel in the land of Egypt is he was being faithful to his promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I want you guys to listen to this. This is Exodus 6, 6 through 8, speaking to the people of Israel about the promise. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egypt. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you from my people. I will be your God. And you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of Egypt. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. This is the why of why the Lord rescued and redeemed his people. He also did it to show his power. This is Exodus 11, 9 through 10. The Lord is hardening Pharaoh's heart so the miracles can multiply. He says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, so that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all of these wonders before Pharaoh, yet the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go out of his land. Why did he do it? To amplify his plagues, to amplify everything he did in Egypt, so people would see the Lord alone is the one who rules. He did it to make his name great on the earth. Listen to this in Exodus 9, 15 through 16. God talks about allowing Pharaoh to remain in order to show his power. It says, For if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would have then been cut off from the earth, speaking to Pharaoh. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Why, why did the Lord do it? So his name would be proclaimed everywhere in the earth. And he also did it so people would know who the Lord is. Listen to these. There's a pattern in here of God saying, I'm doing this so that you'll know. I'm doing it so that you'll know. Listen to this. Exodus 5, 2. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Who is he? That I should obey his voice and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord and besides I won't, let the, I won't let Israel go. Exodus 7, 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. Exodus 7, 17. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand, and it will be turned into blood. Exodus 8.10. Then he said, tomorrow, and this is Pharaoh saying, I want all of the frogs to leave the land tomorrow. So Pharaoh is naming the time. This is when I want it to happen. This is crazy. So he said, Moses, to Pharaoh, may it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Do you see the pattern? I'm doing this so you'll know who Yahweh is. You need to know who I am. What did Pharaoh say in the very beginning? I don't know Yahweh. All of this is for the purpose of him knowing this is who Yahweh is. 8.22 says, But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people are living so that no swarms of flies will be there in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. Exodus 9, 14. For this time, I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. It just keeps going. I'm doing this so that you will know. I'm doing it so that you'll understand. You have to understand who the Lord Yahweh is. It's interesting in the midst of all of this is the Lord's purpose is that the people would know him, that they would worship him, that they would bow down to him, and yet they are not moved in it. This is Exodus 9, 27. 
Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron, and he said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one, and I, my people, are the wicked ones. Doesn't that sound humble? It sounds penitent, doesn't it? He doesn't repent. Exodus 9.30, listen to this. But as for you and your servants, speaking of Pharaoh and his leadership, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. Exodus 10.17. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin. This is Pharaoh. Only this once and make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me. Still no fear of the Lord, but there's a type of reverence. Hey, the plague is hard. God's hand on the nation of Egypt is difficult. Please pray that it would stop. But it didn't produce a fear of the Lord. It didn't produce it. Regardless of the opposition of Pharaoh, the people of Egypt or the Red Sea blocking their path or the lack of water or the lack of food or even the grumbling and the complaining of the people of Israel, the Lord reigned and he ruled over all of it. And what did he do? He delivered his people. This is what Jethro had to hear. We're hearing it now, but Jethro had to hear it. He had to know he was a trustworthy God. He is a God who has no rival. He is a God who desires his name be known throughout the nations. He's Yahweh. That's his name. I want you guys to think about Moses sharing these things with his father-in-law. This is the starting point of every person who's ever been redeemed. Is it not? Somebody has to sit down and tell someone about the great and mighty things that the Lord has done. You have to share with somebody about Christ. You have to share about the power of the gospel. You have to share about the Exodus. God did these things in the land of Egypt, and he delivered two million people out of the hand of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. How is your evangelism going in terms of telling people about the mighty things of God? God calls us to do this. Moses could have talked about the weather. He could have said, well, the weather's nice. The food's okay. The manna's not bad. Let me tell you all about it. He moved in to declaring all these things that the Lord has done. Jethro, at some point, moved to where he is listening to everything that is coming to him. He's hearing who the Lord is. He understands the why of all the plagues. And it moves him to where he grasps it. God's intended purpose of the miracles actually is applied to Jethro. He gets it. This moves us to where the salvation story we looked at of an unlikely convert. The first scene, he hears the testimony of the Lord's deliverance. It moves now to the second. He proclaims his joy over the Lord's deliverance. You see it in verse 9 and 11. Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel in delivering them from the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro said, blessed be the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know. Did you hear that? Did you hear that phrasing? Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. I mean, is that not the right response? That was God's intended purpose. What did he say? I'm doing all of these things so my name will be great in all the earth. So the nations will know who I am. And if you are anything like me, or like sometimes our family Bible reading, I will read over the plagues in Egypt. Like, oh yeah, and then there was this miraculous thing that happened. And this was miraculous. And then Jesus walked on water. And then, uh, yeah, hey, let's wrap up our Bible reading. Let's move on to other things. It's like, no, miraculous things. You're supposed to be shocked and awed at them. And yet we can read them kind of like we're reading a textbook, right? It's an instruction manual. We made our way through these topics. No, we're supposed to be marveled, ooed at these things, looking at them and changed by them. Take one miracle. 
Take the miracle of the darkness and just think about this. The Lord literally placed an invisible border in between the land of Goshen and the land of Egypt. Do you imagine that? You walk outside your house. It's bright and sunny over here. And then I turn this direction and it's pitch black. And there's a weird line going right down the middle of it. And if I walk over to it and I go to one side of it, it is pitch black darkness. And I move to the other side and it is blazing light. That's unexplainable. That is one of the miracles that occurred in Egypt. We are supposed to be moved to wonder over what the Lord did. But Jethro, just like us, he didn't experience any of those plagues, did he? He didn't see one of them. He didn't see the darkness. He didn't see the flies, the gnats. He didn't see the blood in the Nile. He didn't see any of them. He hears it and he believes it with faith. He rejoiced over the goodness that the Lord did to Israel. And the Lord continues to make a distinction. He guards his people. He protected his people. He defended his people. He saved his people. And it moves him to where he rejoices. You know, another place where you find this phrasing of the rejoicing that's here, Job actually uses it in the negative. When he's talking about the day of his birth, Job says, if I could go back to the day of my birth, I hope that there would be no rejoicing over that day. You think about all the joy and the delight a parent has when a child is born. You move from pain and difficulty and labor, which I've never experienced, but I'm there. And as soon as that is wrapped up, joy, delight, excitement, all of those things. That is the rejoicing that Jethro had over the news of God delivering the people of Israel. It's joy. He's delighting over those things. Look at what Jethro says in verse 11. This is really his delightful statement, his joy. He says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. I've heard people say, well, he's just saying he's the greatest of all gods, but he's still holding on to other gods. I want you guys to listen to what Solomon says when they're preparing to build the temple in 2 Chronicles 2.3. Listen to this. Solomon says, the house which I am about to build will be great. For greater is our God than all the gods. So do we put Solomon in the same camp? <laughs> well, he's recognizing all of them, but just one. No, Jethro is saying, the gods of Egypt are devastated. Yahweh is greater than all the gods. He professes that he knows him. This is how every person comes to saving faith, right? You hear the gospel message. Somebody shares the wonderful things that God has done. And what do you do? You proclaim that you believe it. You proclaim that you believe it. This is a, the believer that's able to say, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Why? You proclaim that you know the Lord. This is my testimony. It's on my speech. And this is what you find in Jethro. After he proclaims a blessing of Yahweh, his goodness towards the people, the salvation story of an unlikely convert moves from him hearing the testimony of the Lord's deliverance to the second scene. He proclaims his joy over the Lord's deliverance. And now to the third in the final scene. He worships corporately because of Israel's deliverance and his deliverance. Pick it up in verse 12. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. This is worship. This is worship. The entire scene is worship of the God of Israel by a, for, by a former pagan Midianite priest who is a foreigner, an outsider. He's not part of the covenant promises of Israel. He's bending the knee to the God of Israel as the greatest of all gods. Now, a burnt offering, we're familiar with this in the Old Testament. It was given by a worshiper to make atonement on his behalf. 
If you're looking properly in Leviticus, it's Leviticus chapter 1, 4. Jethro, having heard the testimony of God's deliverance for the people and having a testimony proclaiming that Yahweh is the greatest of all gods, he is moved to worship him here. Now, if he's worshiping Baal, but then you have all the people invited, there's no time in the Old Testament anywhere where God is saying, you know, worship of one God alongside of me, that's fine. I'm comfortable with that. The entire Old Testament is opposed to that. God says he will give his glory to no other. This is the worship of Yahweh. What's wild in it, in verse 12, is that Jethro himself is surprisingly the one who is overseeing the entire ceremony. It's kind of interesting. It says Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, he took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. You don't have Aaron as the individual presiding over this. Jethro is the one that is actually doing it. They're invited to be part of the event. There's also the specific things that are communicated in terms of where the worship is occurring. It doesn't say that they ate before the tent. It doesn't say they ate before the mountain. It says they ate before God. It is specific in terms of what this event is. This is truly just the outward expression of worship that matches the testimony that Jethro has already said out loud. Does this not show us here God's heart for the nations? God's heart for people outside of just his covenant people of Israel. His own people grumbled continually, both in the land of Egypt, when the Lord was bringing plagues on the Egyptians, and after when they made their way into the wilderness. And promises given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they belong to them. They belong to the people of Israel. But the Lord is showing here that regardless of your ethnic background, regardless of your dwelling place, regardless of the worship that you are involved in that is false, the Lord is able to save you. Jethro got it. He understood it with clarity. He didn't see any of it. Well, except for the pillar of cloud and except for the fire and the manna. But he did not see the deliverance that occurred in Egypt. Friends, do you, do you marvel at these things? Have you thought through these things with clarity? Have you considered just the power of the miracles that occurred in Egypt? The hand of God being so magnificent and glorious that he's able to redeem two million people out of the land of Egypt and bring them through the Red Sea in order to bring deliverance. He's faithful to his promises. The promise he made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Even the promise that the people of Israel would be in captivity for four generations, looking at 1,100 year periods. He brings the people out of the land. He is faithful. Do you marvel at Jesus' power to forgive sin? Do you marvel at Jesus saving you from your sin? Do you? If we know the Lord and we're honest, we just don't worship like this, do we? We don't think on these things in the way that Jethro does in terms of looking at what God did in his deliverance. That is not what my heart tends to look like. I labor to have a heart that worships. I labor to have a heart that prays fervently to love the Lord. I am so quick to move to where I am numb to what the Lord has done. This is just a helpful reminder for us to look at it, to think on it, to be refreshed is a helpful reminder for us also to think on communicating what God has done in Christ to those who do not know. Friends, when, when you're tempted to talk about the weather, when you're tempted to talk about a football game, whatever the item is, and there's a time and a place for all that, but in your heart, you're laboring and saying, I need to tell them about Christ. Moses was faithful to do that with Jethro. 
Just pray, labor that the Lord would give you opportunity, courage, boldness to step into those things. He's a God that is immense and powerful and he is worthy of all praise. And so the next time you're wanting to think through a a profound story of an individual who heard about the miraculous things the Lord did and that was sufficient for him to put his faith in Yahweh, think about Exodus 18. And with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a God who is rich and immense And you are a God who is able to perform anything. Your hand is not short that you can't bring about redemption. You are a God who is faithful to deliver your people Israel. You are a God who is faithful to save to the uttermost those that you have saved who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. God, every promise that you have made to those who are in Christ, you will bring about. Every promise you have ever made to Israel in the past, you will bring about. And we long for the day where Israel is restored. Or the things that we have been hearing regularly in the book of Revelation. What a joy to think on those things. Lord, we long for the day where you return. Lord, make us faithful individuals in our evangelism, faithful individuals, believers in the way that we think on your power and glory. And I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.